So when we look at, you know, um, studying this particular unit, which is business environment, the reason of, um, you know, inclusion of this unit in level four in the course that you're doing business and management is to primarily understand, you know, the internal and external environment, which basically affects businesses or organizations. And how how do you as a person when you in a business or an organization, then look at, you know, um, understanding these factors uh, with regards to um, uh, the impact they have. And then at some stage, the idea would be to also try and understand, uh, you know, things in terms of the key models, which you will use at some point in time to analyze information, you know, uh, with regards to um, the importance of that information with regards to the business. So there are a couple of sections which, um, which relate to economics in business. Uh, and the reason why we look at is <clears throat> when, as you know, that when you, when you particularly um, say work in an organization or an organization which produces goods and services is basically, you know, an organization which provides these to its consumers for purchase. They are in some sort of a business. That means they make these goods and services or produce these goods and services, and then they basically make it available for, uh, you know, consumers to buy. In, in the terms of, um, you know, everything which happens within the organization and also outside the organization, uh, there are lots of things which affect the trade or affect the, you know, the operations of the business. So here, when we get into the nitty, what we need to know is, first of all, we need to understand what are the different types of organizations, uh, you know, in terms of limited companies, types of companies, you know, those things we will understand. And once you understand the structure, uh, you know, of the companies or organizations, how they are formed, what requires them um, to have this structure, regulation. We'll, have, we'll also understand a bit of legislation like the Companies Act and, you know, the uh, registration has to be done as a specific company on different, uh, you know, in different countries. It is different, but pretty much follows the same uh, pattern of, uh, you know, uh, legal requirements which are there. And then at some stage, what we will do is we will start to understand how businesses are affected by government policies. So policies like, uh, you know, fiscal and monetary policy, we will look at things like uh, um, change rate inflation. We will also look at how complex business. And in order to study this, we will look at a lot of models uh, or, you know, um, when I say models, are we are going to look at theoretical frameworks in particular to be able to do this analysis. And then we'll progress on to looking at studying uh, and understanding what are the, uh, you know, external market forces in particular which affect business. So they could be that, as you know, most companies today yeah. have products and services which go across geographies. So they sell products and services internationally. How uh, the international rules and regulations um, uh, affect the business. Uh, you you see a lot of people now employed by organizations. They come from diverse culture, background. So how the structure and the culture of the organization, you know, shapes up. And these things are important for us to understand if at, at a very basic level, because when we start to work in an organization, we need to be able to get to grasp with some of these things pretty much, uh, you know, quite quickly. And some of these key bits that we will study in this unit will also relate to understanding, you know, um, certain types of trade agreements. So when we look at the World Trade Agreement, we look at WTO as an organization, we look at the European Union. Uh, in terms of, you know, when UK does business with the rest of the countries and we are going out of the European Union. So there'll be a bit of that understanding. In the Asian context, we have SARC, you know, the South Asian Regional Cooperation, uh, you know, which is which is a setup which basically is, um, you know, I think about seven or eight different countries are a part of that, including Pakistan. So those um, setups is what we need to understand when we look at business from a point of view of internationalization, that means it's a global business. So as we go along in this unit, the basics would be to start with understanding the company, the structure, who are, pe what are the people involved? Then we go on to understanding the policies and, you know, environment which affects the business in terms of its operation, what legislation is must they need to follow. Followed by, we will look at, uh, you know, the, um, the market forces which affect, which is external environment in particular. And then we look at the internationalization of the business. Now, in order to develop a detailed understanding, what we've done is we picked out one of the recommended books on um, you know business environment. And this book is something which is now available for you to look at and 
uh, you know, in, in the Moodle. And here, what we will do is, this is a very extensive book, which will cover this unit in absolutely great detail. So there'll be some bit of reading that you will do, uh, you know, apart from the discussions that we do on the on the webinars. But the additional reading will help you to also crystallize some of the thoughts that we discuss using PowerPoint slides. Plus, it will also help you in, uh, you know, doing tasks and assignments, uh, which is set for this particular unit as we go along. Now, um, and every session that we do after that, what I'm going to try and do is basically refer you to some pages in the book. I'm just quickly skip, uh, you know, skipping through some of the pages to go to chapter one. And in this case, you know, um, what we're going to do is once we do the session for learning outcome one, I'm going to try and recommend you to look reading, you know, a few pages from the book, which helps you further detail out what we've discussed in the, in the webinar. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? And the book will also give us examples to discuss. There'll, there'll be a few case studies that we could discuss. And those bits will help you to show application and practice when you, you know, start doing the assignment in terms of doing the tasks. Yeah. So let's look at uh, the presentation, uh, you know, for learning outcome one, which is what uh, we will go through today in particular. And um, at some stage, what we will do is um, when we summarize, feel free to ask me any questions or Thing that you don't understand. So, um, in the first instant, we're going to look at you know um, the overarching you know task one that we want to look at in particular uh, to understand you know the different types of organizations and what are their purpose. Now, <clears throat> when we look at uh, you know uh, an entity or a business entity being formed, uh, something which operates within an environment, we normally look at the uh, you know formation of a company. And when you look at the formation of a company, um, you know, what tends to happen is that they have to be set up as a legal entity uh, because they have a lot of people which will work within the organization. So the organization, when it is set up as a legal entity, has, you know, the written policies and procedures um, so that they can protect both the employer and the employee. And when we look at that, um, you know, so sometimes when you set it up, we look at different types of companies. We look at different type of structures and different type of legal entities. Now, in our case, when we look at uh, specifically with regards to the classification and the type of organization which are normally called, we basically to look at two types for us. We look at public sector and we look at private sector. The public sector is defined as organizations which are primarily owned by the government or the state. And here, these organizations typically provide basic infrastructural services to, uh, you know, uh, its citizens or, you know, to people in, in, in that particular location, country or geography. Private sector organizations are organizations which have ownership from individuals or consortiums or, you know, a group of individuals. And these organizations have to follow rules and regulations set by the company's house or maybe some sort of an act or legislation present in, a, in each and every country. So in the UK's context, we have something called the company's house. And when they look at forming a company, which is a private sector company, uh, which operates in the private sector, that means it provides services. And in return, it will ask for, it will make profits. So there are lots of differentiations and definition of how we define, you know, a private sector company. But basically, companies are in the process of, you know, uh, making profits. And they have investments which have been done by, uh, you know, um, you know, individuals or uh, I would say, um, you know, consortiums. They would look at, um, you know, basic objectives of, uh, you know, basically having some sort of a return on investment or, you know, some capital. And here they provide services which have to be paid for in general uh, if you avail of their, uh, you know, services. So when you look at uh, a list of large private sector companies in the UK, we we'll, we look at some of the big brands like Marks and Spencer, Next, uh, you know, which are uh, or Tesco's, for example. These are all private sector companies, and they've been set up, uh, you know, because um, they were originally businesses. Uh, once they were set up, their main aim was to make profits and obviously provide some of these services to consumers. And there is a part ownership of these companies, which is typically um, through the ownership of shares and bonds, which is in the uh, um, you know domain of public. Now, if we have to broadly then kind of you know um, categorize private and public sector organizations, what we do is in the private sector, 
we look at different categorization which is things like sole proprietorships partnerships cooperatives limited companies and also public limited companies and then in the pure domain of public sector uh, you know businesses we look at state corporations you know like electricity boards water boards and things like that and also we look at you know companies which are owned by the state as, as a, you know nationalized uh, industries or nationalized companies so things like if you if you look at say electricity producing companies you look at um, companies which serve the defense sector for example or are sensitive in terms of producing goods and services those companies are generally owned by the owned by the state or the uh, government in in that particular country so going forward what we did is um trying to understand you know what are the characteristics of each in uh, different each and in different type of you know each different type of uh, uh, company structure under private uh, you know sector first so in the case of sole proprietorship what we look at is these are as a name itself gives the meaning away sole means you have only one person which is primarily the uh, you know the, the business and here in sole proprietorship the person who kind of starts the business off or you know when we look at examples of shopkeepers or people who run, run small businesses and wherein they are the mainstay of the business being the owner the director and also uh, you know the person who retains yeah. most of the profit they tend to fall into something called sole proprietorship so most businesses actually start off with you know sole proprietorships uh, in some sense or the other um and in general when we look at these businesses here what tends to happen is that you will see any profits or losses which the business makes at the end of the financial year or at the end of the term is actually uh, you know the direct benefit or disadvantage of the owner of the organization so this is the simplest form of setup which can be done and here the owner of the business actually bears the entire risk of running it now if the business fails and the business fails or collapses or folds the owner of the business basically will take the full you know responsibility and that is why uh, you know and if the business makes a lot of profit it's doing quite well then in that case he pockets his most of the profit in the uh, you know money being generated by the business so there are advantages and disadvantages now these are listed on the slide so when we look at when you want to start something of your own uh, which is an enterprise or a business or a commercial venture what most people do is they set it up as a sole proprietorship because it's quick and easy to set up does not require any legal inco incorporation that means not much legal documentation is required and then um in terms of startup costs the costs are very low so you might want to start off a small business and you could start it from your own house your own home you might not want to employ people at the beginning you know so things like in terms of office cost and you know other associated costs with regards to manpower and things like that are kind of minimal now the gain and the loss is directly related to the owner and because sometimes you will see the owner and the owner is also the director or the uh, you know the main person in the business decision making is very very simple and decision making is quite efficient and quite quick or prompt and sometimes you will see that in some play, uh, countries in particular sole proprietors uh, or people who produce goods and services may not need to be filing uh, you know uh, say for example legal papers or legal uh, you know papers in terms of publishing their accounts essentially they might have to you know uh, do the accounts they might have to submit tax everything that is mandatory but their publishing of accounts might not be a legal requirement and this advantage is being that you know sometimes when you have to start a business and you need a startup capital or you need some money to start the business then here because you are the only one who's starting off and the business does not have any uh, you know kind of uh, reputation or past experience this tends to have a bit of a disadvantage because you can only put in savings or you know you have to depend on funds which are your own generated for to be able to start the business now apart from that sometimes you will feel that because you're a small business and you kind of have started it yourself it is sometimes difficult to kind of you know attract the right talent or other resources who will come in and do the business or be a part of the business and sometimes you will see that the operations are totally dependent on the owner itself because the decision making happens with the owner 
simple example is if you are a shopkeeper and you have opened up a shop and you offer some services what will happen is that until unless the owner comes in the morning to open the shop the services or people or customers will actually not start to walk in or come to the shop to buy goods and services so if you open a shop at 9 o'clock in the morning you might have customers coming in early the business might be good for that day but if for some reason you end up opening the shop uh, you know at 12 o'clock that would mean that you know because the shop is shut you might lose a lot of business or customers because the entire operation is actually dependent on you so sole proprietorship in a nutshell are businesses which are are most businesses which start off as this type of uh, business where the owner thinks of an idea or you know comes up with an innovative idea and he decides to start the business there are lots of advantages disadvantages advantages being uh, that you know documentation and legal framework might not be very mandatory or strict but disadvantages being that you know there are high levels of risk associated with it but also high level of gain and most of the investment in the business actually comes in from the owner or the, the person who started the business mm -hmm. if you look at ladies who work uh, part time uh, people who work as contractors <coughs> people who provide services because of their skills like you know typical example here would be plumbers electrician uh, people who run their own shops or offer services uh, which which are you know variable that means they only offer these services on the weekends uh, sometimes you will see tuition uh, you know which provide tuition they tend to be you know sole owners and sole operators of the business and that is why you know these businesses fall into something called sole proprietorship is that okay right. yeah okay now as the business tends to expand what will happen is you will see that you need more injection into uh, more injection in terms of cash into the business you might also want more individuals or people to come in and work in the business and that would at some stage mean that if you're looking at expanding the business or if you're looking at growing the business uh, or if you're opening a branch of the business in a different location then in some of those cases initially uh, you know sole proprietors will develop into something called partnership but sometimes people also form ships and start a business so when you look at accountancy firms when you look at solicitor or legal uh, lawyers uh, you know or legal firms or firms which actually or come or basically people which offer professional services they generally tend to start uh, you know a business in the form of uh, you know partnerships so what will happen is an example is if you look at large um, you know accounting firm pwc price waterhouse coopers now this is actually a combination of three different companies if you look at erst and young again two companies so these companies were essentially you know professional chartered accountants or uh, you know large partnerships because what they did was when they started the business off there were two or three accountants which got together a group of accountants which got together and started offering certain services but as the business grew what tend to, tended to happen is that they kind of started to amalgamate uh, uh you know other partnerships which were essentially offering the similar services and brought it into under a big brand so some of these businesses involve in general um you know more than two individuals or it could be up to 20 individuals in a partnership uh, as far as uk companies law and here what they tend to do is the reason of coming together is that they have they normally see a synergy that they have functions which are mutually exclusive that means if i do something then that function is exclusive to me and you on the other side who are a partner kind of tend to do other function an example here of that would be that when we look at partnerships i might come in and do teaching you might come in and do say somebody else would come in and do marketing somebody else would come in and do operations so here we are all working in the same setup but we have different functions to perform and that is why what we do is we become equal partners and sometimes you will see that these companies or groups of individuals coming together they tend to form something called a partnership now here the key difference between this and sole proprietorship is that sole proprietors you have only one person running the business in this case you have many people up to 20 running the business here the profits and the liabilities are shared by the business that means if the business makes a lot of profit it is going to be equally split up 
depending on the partnership agreement which has been done now sometimes you will see two people come together and they become partners they say okay i own 60% of the stake because i've invested 60% of the money into this and you are 40% stakeholder but at the end of the year if the business makes say 100 pounds or 100 rupees as profit that is going to be split as 60 40 because that is written in the partnership agreement so here partnerships essentially work wherein the profits and liabilities of the business are shared across the number of people in the partnership again this is seen in terms of the advantage is it is uh, easy to form uh, a lot of people do not need to do legal paperwork a member of memorandum of understanding mou is essentially put together which basically defines the roles and responsibilities of individual people in the organization and what role they play how much stake they have and that seems to be a legal document as long as you uh, you know everybody signs it and everybody kind of you know the document now because there are many people some of the advantages will be that a lot of people can put in the capital into the business if it is required to grow the business buy an equipment or you know take more office space hire more people so sometimes you will see different partners investing into the business and they then then automatically kind of augment the agreement depending on the stake or the money they are being they are putting in expertise tends why do you think a lot of people come together in this business is because they feel that they can contribute on their uh, you know skills on their experience and they have expertise which nobody other has and that is why they want to bring that person into the business so that that will help bridge the area in terms of gap or help the business you know grow in in a different field so look at sticking to solicitors sometimes you will see a solicitor or a legal business starts off as a business specializing on immigration but as they grow as a business they do feel that they also have a lot of customers coming in for asking for commercial law or family law you know and then what they do is they say okay i am a specialist in immigration i want to i want you to uh, have a partnership with me and we can work together on this wherein you handle family law, i handle immigration you know or then they bring in a third partner they say okay you handle commercial law and i handle immigration and somebody handles family law so with the three of them they then become partners to be able to run this business now because this is partnership and there is room for them to grow up to 20 different partners in the business there is room for scalability that means uh, they can be up to 20 solicitors in the business or you know up to 20 solicitors in the business which can actually come in and offer services which are maybe exclusive if the immigration side of the business becomes too big then some where they will that the side of the business is well getting more cases so one person is not able to handle and they bring that in so that the other person comes in and takes the load so becomes an appropriate percentage holder or a partner within the business is that okay yeah yeah now the third type that we look at is private limited companies or plc now private limited company is um, as the name says limited it basically has uh, you know a clear differentiation between um, you know individuals owning the business and owning the liability of the business so here a private limited company is actually owned by individuals which could be classified as owners but in order to formally document the structure a memorandum of articles is formed rather than a memorandum of understanding and this moe is now then set in stone as per the legal requirement at the company's house or maybe uh, you know an authority which registers these companies and the partnership stake or basically partnership or stake within the organization is actually depicted through the form of something called shares so because this company then operates in the public domain what tends to happen is that this type of business is then required to be kind of formed as a separate entity and under the company's law this entity needs to then maintain its books of account and publish the books of account every year from uh, and this normally follows maybe the financial cycle or maybe the accounting year set for in that particular country so when you look at in the uk most of the accounting year you know regulates from 6th of say 5th of april to 5th of april of any year till you know uh, 4th of april the subsequent year and that becomes the annual you know uh, cycle in which the company accounts have to be submitted so here 
it becomes a legal requirement for you to be able to submit accounts in a particular format and that accounts have to be then maintained and submitted by a competent authority like an accountant or a chartered accountant and in some cases if the turnover is large enough and it's over six and a half million pounds that account those accounts need to be also audited before they are submitted to company's house now here because you become a company expansion and bringing in new people or new investors into the company as partners is easier because all you have to do is issue shares so if i have a company limited by 100 shares that means some shares will be with me some shares will be with somebody else but the total sum of the shares which have been issued is 100 now if you have to look at um, in bringing in new partners what will happen is one of the partners might have to give 20 shares and get some capital against it because he's doing away with his shares uh, in terms of the control of the company. So sometimes you will see in a limited company there are more than three more you know more than three shareholders or more than two shareholders because the um, let's put it this way the ownership of the company is guided or basically guaranteed by the number of shares that you hold, and this then allows you to. Uh, become a director or hold a responsibility position within the uh, organization. PLC essentially tends to be, um, you know, private limited company tends to be a company which is owned by individuals, but here uh, the ownership is basically based on shareholders pattern or, you know, the number of shares that you own in the company. Now, the key difference between a private sector uh, company, private sector, private limited company and a public limited company is when the shares of the company in this case public limited are traded on a stock exchange that means the ownership of the company can be distributed to investors uh, on a stock exchange then that company then gets into a classification of something called public limited company so an example here would be when you look at private I think I was a private limited company because he had 100% ownership. But when he ventured into other businesses, other businesses would mean that he started the you know railways business or the airline business. Then you would see that he needed a large amount of investment to happen in the organization. Buying aircrafts or leasing aircrafts or you know getting onto large contracts, which allowed him to you know offer services like mobile phones, railways, you know, um, and also airlines meant that his company needed a large injection of capital to be able to buy some of these assets and then offer these services so what he did was because his company was quite profitable he listed his company on the stock exchange and listing the company on stock exchange meant that they charged a bit of premium to sell the shares but the ownership of the company then went across to public that means you could own two shares 200 shares 2000 shares or depending on what you could afford and when you own these shares or bought these shares on the stock exchange you became a part owner of that company so here the ownership of the company is distributed amongst a wider set of people or audiences and these people or audiences could be investors angel investors people who invest into companies it could be normal members of the public and it could be, you know, even family members uh, within uh, or, you know, relatives or family members within your own, uh, you know, uh, uh, family or, you know, near dear ones that you know. Now, <clears throat> when the company becomes and when we use the term called publicly traded company, that means the shares of this company are traded on various stock exchanges. So you might list the company into London Stock Exchange, New York Stock Exchange you know karachi stock exchange things like that bombay stock exchange you know wherever but as in when you invest and list your company for public to buy shares or stake into it uh, on different stock exchanges what you are doing is every time you list a share in a different um, market you are diluting the share holding capacity of the company but that dilution is bringing in more money because a lot of people are going to buy your shares basis the business and the idea or the profitability of the business they want to own the business and because that will bring in money that allows the company to grow and because that allows the company to go grow 
it also means on the other hand that the shares uh, the ownership of the company in the hands of the main person or the founder of the company starts to reduce sometimes you will see that owners will sell up to 49 percent of the shares but retain 50 percent 51 percent because they want the majority stakeholding in that organization but as the companies become big wherein they churn a lot of turnover make a lot of profit across the year in any financial year what owners do is they sell their stake in the company to public or to investors and take out large sums of capital by selling that per percentage or that share in that uh, company so they are relinqu relinquishing control essentially what they are trying to do is they're trying to relinquish control to other people for them to come in and invest in the company and also own the company to a certain extent and that difference is a big difference which kind of separates the classification of a private sector uh, you know when you say in private sector private limited companies from public limited companies now one of the key things that you will see is somebody might invest into the business you know uh, say for example if you run a business you might not want to have the conversion of your company from private limited to public limited because you do feel that you have enough cash flow you have enough profits and enough retained earnings within the business and you do not need a fresh injection so that fresh cash injection or capital being not required you might continue to operate as a private limited company a simple example of that which i'll give you is if you see dell uh, computers now that as an organization michael dell you know who's the chairman and the owner or the founder of dell computers when they started off the business was doing quite well and for about 20 odd years uh, the business did well and what they did was in between somewhere uh, in order to expand operations globally they listed the company in different stock exchanges and the ownership of the company became public because the company was generating revenue in excess of 20 30 billion dollars now in 2011 when the business model began to change dell dell computers market share in the uh, you know in in terms of the market in regards to the competitors started to come down it started to make losses and then michael dell again came back to the helm of the company and what he did was by investing his own capital he took the company private so he bought out all the uh, shareholders in the company and that company he said in order to relieve it from pressures of trading on the stock exchange because when you have shareholders they expect results and the results do the shares take a beating people start selling the shares at loss and then the company starts to make uh, you know loss as far as uh, the share trading is concerned so what he did was he took the company private by buying out all the shareholders and in order to relieve it from the pressures of expectation which the shareholders investors have in the company and that again meant that he took the company private so after having traded about 21 22 years now as a public limited organization what he did was in order to sustain and also to stabilize the business because the market was changing pcs were turning into tablets and you know that kind of market and dell wasn't uh, you know ready to shift to that market what he did was he said okay i'm going to come back to the company again become uh, you know the major shareholder and i'm going to take the private and this has helped dell to restructure his business and at some stage I, i'm i'm not sure but at some stage the company will again go back onto the stock exchange uh, or at least one or two different stock exchange and he will relinquish some part of the ownership and then let the company run as a public limited company now in general in the uk what you do get to see is companies which are six and a half million in terms of turnover might still be private limited companies they might not want the capital to come in or have ownership with uh, the public so here the companies continue to run until unless for various reasons and these reasons could be additional financing it could be to look at you know taking the business global it could be to look at you know expanding into a different segment those are reasons which companies look at wherein they want to look at public ownership and they want to expand the business exponentially and that is where private limited companies would tend to follow the route to become public limited companies is that okay yes is that clear enough yes okay good stuff now there are these are some examples of you know different types of organizations which are put in when you look at public sector organization the police you know anything which I mentioned which is national ownership or ownership of the state like the home office the national health service here universities 
those are companies which are public sector organizations here the main stakeholder the main owner of the business or the main uh, stakeholder as far as running day to day operations is concerned is basically the government and that is why these are public sector private sector organizations which have ownership from investors and owners and members of the public uh, could because these are large organizations and they trade and sell goods and services across different geographies or countries they tend to be classified as private sector organizations now this is a chart which kind of you know what we've gone through kind of helps you summarize the base of uh, you know different types of companies in in a nice little table so when you look at ownership you look at regulation some of the factors and you can compare that accordingly on a table uh, you know very clearly when you look at following this particular chart is that okay so this is a bit of a summary for task 1.1 where it says well, if, I, if i say and ask you that okay if the size of the business is fairly small and uh, then three uh, you know main uh, owners of the business you can then quickly go to this table and see okay uh, i think in terms of ownership and if i look at the size of the business you're saying is fairly small that means this business is turning over less than 6 and 1/2 million dollars or you know 6 and 1/2 million pounds sorry then this business could be classified as a partnership or primarily if i had used the word share then it would have been a private limited company so this is where you know you could look at the main parameters and the main types of uh, function each type of business needs to have to be classified as a particular type having a particular type of ownership is that okay yeah okay now when we look at this is a follow up slide just to summarize um you know again when different types of businesses they look at size and the goal so for example if i look at any organization and i compare that on to two factors uh, what is the size of the organization and what is the what are the goals of the organization what type of services they provide so i can list them accordingly by you know this particular table uh, which is from proprietorship to franchise i can list them accordingly here and then divide them in you know this particular chart so when i look at somebody who's looking at uh, you know offering products and services um, but they want to offer it solely on the basis that they are the sole owner and their size of operation is small we can group them into something called small companies when i look at an example of say a franchise that would mean that the brand and the key services which the company offers are in control of the main a company or the founder of the business but in order to offer these services across different cities they get into a model wherein they invite public private partnership and in that case those public private partnerships would be classified as something called a franchise so mcdonalds for example as a business you look at subway as a business at kentucky fried chicken as a business so food food in general when you look at uh, as a business they would have a medium size but here because the owner has invented or created the product and business and now wants to do expansion he might choose a rule a route essentially to uh, expand the operations by using a type of a which is called franchise and here the franchise could be owned by the individual or owned by the uh, by an investor and when we look at that franchise it basically follows the same guidelines primarily you know of um, um you know the main company and the directions from the main company but the ownership is not only limited to the owner, but also to the per investor or the person who has invested into the franchise and this is normally done to expand businesses across you know cities so one of the models through which organizations can grow and sometimes if they offer products and services which are consumer products and services you would see businesses would expand using something called a model of franchise so when you look at schools for example now in our countries we have lots of schools you know you have um, you know you have an army public school the army public school originally would have started as one such setup in the main city but over a point in time what has happened is because there's a demand and the uh, you know the children of the forces which work together uh, you know basically people who work in the forces are deployed across different locations within the country what the government has tended to do is create these schools as a franchise wherein each of these schools are under the same name or the umbrella follow the same guidelines but they have become 
uh, a single entity and that become that has become a chain and here what has happened is you would look at it as a franchise is that clear enough yeah yeah okay now let's look at going to you know the second part where we want to understand you know the structure of the organization now because there are lots of people and lots of ways in which the business definitely works there are lots of people who have different role within the organization and sometimes you will see that it is important for us to understand when you go into and have a conversation with someone it is important for you to basically go in and understand who is this person where is he placed in the organization what role does he have and how much of uh, you know decision making power he has within that role so when we look at this particular you know a slide what we do tend to see that people who have a stake or an ownership into the company would be classified as somebody called shareholders that means uh, that company might be uh, trading onto the stock exchange and it is a large organization and here people who own or have ownership through means of shares would be called shareholders now shareholders are not necessary that they will be working within the company sometimes you will see that organizations in order to retain individuals or you know keep performing individuals within the organization offer them something called employee stock option plan that means the company would offer them to become owners by giving them some stock that stock they can sell in 2 years 3 years 5 years 10 years uh, but they also then tend to become shareholders or have interest within the company and that could be done that they, they don't want them to go away or they don't want them to leave the company because they are as a as a as, as the work within the organization they are an important part and parcel of the organization so anybody in short who owns shares will uh, will be termed as something called shareholders now under the shareholders you will have something called a board or if it's a large organization typically you will have people in the board which work and have different responsibilities so some people will have financial responsibility some will have operational responsibility some will look at setting the vision long term vision and these could be founder or the main person who founded the company and in smaller companies you will tend to see there is no board for an advisory board there will be something called directors that means people who own the company and have large stake holding in terms of share holding within the organization now sometimes you will see directors having the share holding sometimes you will see these are people who are sleeping directors which have share holding but have no active role in the company so they sit on the board but or they sit on the board means they attend general meetings they look at direction strategic decision making and they are a part and parcel of that sometimes when you bring in external talent to lead the company and you know kind of provide leadership and take the company from one location or you know one position to the other you will see that people who join in and that position are classified as people who are directors that means people who have supreme you know power to make decision and decision is binding and those people will be classified as you know something called uh, you know directors now under directors you will have a lot of different types of people now when i say different types of people you will have people who primarily are you know um, workers who are working in the middle management senior management they work in the frontline services and they then tend to you know kind of look at uh, they then tend to kind of look at you know working on day to day activities or functions within the organization so here what i would primarily do in this case would be when we look at say an example of unilever in this case and when we look at unilever which is an organization as a as a company they are present pretty much everywhere in the world right so when we look at unilever unilever structure in terms of ownership you know is basically um, divided under uh, uh, as shown on this slide so here when you see uh, it is a company which is primarily you know a british company but also a dutch company because the unilever uh, was essentially you know um, um you know initially a british organization but over the years the dutch or the danish have invested and you know they have also brought in and there was a merger and obviously because of which the company essentially became you know a, a merged entity and that is why you know they are now termed as unilever now the reason why they have done this and it has happened over a point in time is the company's operation are very huge so what has happened is you have independent entity which work within each country 
So if you look at Unilever, they make pretty much, you know, P&G, Procter & Gamble and Unilever. The reason I've taken this example is they pretty much are present in most of the countries in the world, say 190 countries in the world. They produce everything from detergents to butter to brands, soaps, everything that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. So they are companies which are categorized in something called fast moving consumer good or FMCG companies. Turnover is in billions of pounds or billions of dollars. And they typically would, you know, have a multiple complex structure running these set of companies in different geographies. Now, the, the reason I say this is when you look at Unilever in, say, for example, uh, UK, and you look at Unilever in Europe, Unilever in Americas, Unilever in other countries like China, in Pakistan, you will see that they have a local entity or a local uh, company which is formed in that geography. Now, because the operations of the companies are so huge, what tends to happen is they create something called joint ownership. And the joint ownership of an organization uh, looks at because they want to save taxation, they want to look at complying with the local legislation in that geography. And because they want to do that, their structures tend to be complex. Now, when we look at, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, their structures being complex, what we tend to see is that you will uh, normally see that because they're also listed in different stock exchanges, you know, what that would mean is that the company has ownership in, you know, local countries as well. It means people or employees working within the organization have ownership and that would mean that that company would typically also have maybe a tie up with some other company and they would then have a joint ownership. So when we look at, say, Unilever as an example, present in Italy, you know, they have something called a joint ownership with a company called NVXR, which is an Italian company and it's a competitor. But what they've done is they've come together and they offer these same products and services which Unilever produces. Some of them are branded products in the name of XOR, NV, or some of them are branded products in the name of Unilever. So in order to be in that market, what they do see is that if they come into the market and they want to kind of, you know, uh, sell their products and services, it is going to be a big competition leading to a lot of, uh, you know, duplication. So what they tend to do is do a tie up or maybe some sort of a create some sort of a partnership with a very um let's say with a partnership with a local locally strong organization and that partnership then has joint ownerships within uh, both the companies and they then go to market together so in the case you were just to understand you know this slide the idea is to wake you up and with this, the company has different tools within the structure of the organization is different People who own shares will be called shareholders. People who have absolute authority in terms of decision making might have ownership in terms of shares would be called either directors or board, but will be on the board of directors. And then when we look at this company's operation in different geographies, sometimes you will see because of the scale of operation they have, they sometimes in order to comply with the legislation and order to make business favorable to save taxes, to serve more consumers, they get into partnership or joint ventures, and uh, not the word partnership, they get into something called G or joint ventures with the locally strong competitor in order to address that market for products and services. And that tends to happen. And in that case, the ownership of that entity, which gets created because of JV or joint partnership, you will see, uh, you know, has joint holding with the head office company and the local entity. A simple example I will give you, which I think you will be able to correlate is, you see our countries wherein Toyota and Nissan produce cars, right? Mm -hmm. Initially, when they started to come uh, and uh, sell cars in the country, they were fully imported from Japan, correct? Yes. But over a point in time, what has happened is, in order to reduce the price of the cars to comply with the taxation and also to create jobs in the economy and have a long-term stay, what these companies have Toyota and is they have created joint ventures with a local company in your country or like India and Pakistan to produce parts and to produce and assemble cars in the country for the public, for the masses. Yes. And that had created where, uh, something called a joint venture wherein the main part of the assembly of the car, like the engine or maybe the electro electronics still from the head office, 
but all the other parts in terms of you know the uh, assembly you know when we look at uh, upholstery the tires and other bits and pieces which go into the car are now being locally produced with a partner that they have tied up and together what they have done is they have localized the production of toyota and you know nissan cars in the country by creating jobs but by forming a joint venture is that okay so what that has meant for the consumers is the price of the car has come down it has created jobs and the government has helped the company because the government they have also complied with the government legislation because they are able to save a bit of tax or maybe they have to park a bit of profits and pay taxation in that country rather than you know paying and taking all the money back to japan so this kind of ownership or the partnership the, not the partner this kind of joint venture or joint uh, ownership which has been created between a local company in pakistan and the head office of the company head office of the company like nissan or toyota in japan has created a local business which has both ownership from the local organization which was a company based in pakistan also has uh, the nissan company in japan also has ownership of that particular company but the stakes might vary so you know the local partner might have maybe more stake but the uh, um, you know the foreign company which has come into and started operation over a point in time will have lesser and lesser stake and that would become nissan motors pakistan limited or toyota motors pakistan limited something like that so over a point in time this particular venture would become independent but it will still have direct tie ups with the head office to be able to supply technology engine and other bits and pieces which are required to assemble the car and that would localize the assembly but at the same point in time uh, you know make the product more cheaper and more affordable to masses in that uh, in that geography or that country is that okay so it is critical for us to understand is because when we look at business and when we look at business environment a lot of companies now have products which are sold in different countries and in order to kind of make these products and price points viable what companies have started to do is they have started to form joint ventures with local competitors or companies which are in that domain and that allows them to overall reduce the price of goods and also comply with legislation in that uh, uh, in that country and as a result become a local company as against a foreign brand okay yeah now that is what i've depicted here about unilever so if you see unilever you know it's a dutch biggest national conglomerate you know it operates in 190 countries they serve about 2 billion customers every day so whether you buy soaps oils soups you know ice creams tea whatever it is they sell pretty much every sort of product that we can think of they are pretty much in uh, you know they have unilever as a company has 30% market share in food products 33 in personal care 19% in refreshment and 18% in home care products and they as a company across the globe when they operate in 190 countries have more than 171000 uh, employees so in unilever is present in pakistan as well i think and when you look at they might have 2 3 4 000 employees working within that company but that will be unilever pakistan limited it won't be unilever you know uk limited and that is a company which basically sells the products locally markets the products and you know uh, employees um you know a lot of people within the country and then complies with the law and legislation of that organ you know of that geography this is just to show you a you know a, a structure so unilever has something called the divisional structure division means each of the business when you look at the soap division when you look at the foods division or when you look at the home care division these are divisions which are big that their turnovers itself are you know 2 3 4 billion dollars uh, for each of the division each of the products so here each of the division has their own chief executive or a managing director and they report into <coughs> something called you know the board so here just to give you an example as we have grouped the business uh, you know um, the previous slide into these four sections <coughs> right now if i look at and if i look at this chart Paul Polman is the CEO of Unilever globally. Underneath that, you have financial officer, HR officer, you know, um, other key functions which basically are managed as from the head office. But because each of the divisions are big, 
you see that there is a separate person who manages the home care product division because this is one of the largest revenue generators for Unilever. And if they look at a particular geography like Europe, Europe as a geography is very big in terms of financial turnover. That means it turns out a lot of money and turnover in terms of finances. They have a separate president which manages just the European operations. So within Europe, you have 27 countries and each of the individual managing director of the company actually reports into something called the president of your Unilever Europe. So they have very complex structure and that complex structure. The reason I'm explaining that is <clears throat> it helps us understand the various stakeholders in the organization. So a large setup a large company will have lots of shareholders within the organization and a small company or a small setup will have limited number of shareholders or people who actually have day to day working within the company. Now, if I look at a small business, you know, like a shopkeeper, let's look at a small business like a shopkeeper, which basically sells grocery and, you know, other products. You see the owner maybe is the one of the business, uh, you know, owners, he is He's one of the person who works in the business. But apart from that, you will see maybe three, four employees in the business who handle day to day operation of like shelving the stocks or, you know, looking at taking orders or serving the customers on the till. So the business has maybe four or five employees and each of these employees, when they work within the, uh, you know, organization, I can group them under employee. If there is one owner, then the owner or basically the director of the company, which is which is because as a shopkeeper is a sole proprietorship, you will see the owner is one category. You have employees, which is the second category. Now, because the shop sells a lot of goods and services and they buy it from their suppliers or you know various suppliers, suppliers become the third stakeholder, correct? And because this business turns over some uh, you know revenue and makes some profit, at the end of the year they have to publish the accounts or follow some regulations, this then looks at the government becoming one of the stakeholders, correct? Because they have to comply with law and legislation. And then if they do not deal with anybody else, then this has four types of stakeholders in the business. One is the owner or the investor, you have employers, uh, sorry, employees, staff, which su supply the material to the shop for uh, as and when the orders come in and you know things like that so this as a small business has only four type of stakeholders that means if the shop is being run and you have no customers buying your products and services then the business would fail because at the end of the day as a shop when you run you are supposed to sell your services or you know you're selling your goods that that are in the shop things like you know grocery you know whatever it is like a newspaper and things like that if there's nobody to buy then what will happen is the business will fail, isn't it? Yeah. So if we do not have customers coming in and shopping in that shop, then the business would fail. So one of the important stakeholders in the business would be, you know, customers. Okay. So if we don't have customers, the business would fail. The business idea would fail and the whole setup would fail. Now, the other side is if you have lots of customers coming in and owner is the only one who is serving the customers, he at some point in time will be on the taking the money also you know maybe going out to serve the customer that will also create a bit of discomfort with customers because waiting time would be there or a lot of them would not be on time and you know there'll be lots of things to manage so here employees if he doesn't have in the shop maybe one or two employees whatever it is depending on the size of the operation employees become an important stakeholder of the business so put employees the the business will not be able to serve customers uh, you know appropriately now in most shops you see husband and wife working or you see a family working but at the end of the day they all become employees at some stage and that is where they serve the customers so depending on the size of the business the stakeholders of the business can be many and they can be quite varied so it's a unilever because they have something called corporate social responsibility, they have to look at, you know, environmental, uh, you know, protection. They have what do you call, you know, NGOs, non-government organizations or, you know, charities which work uh, and keep a check on, you know, their products and services not creating environmental pollution and things like that. So here they have other stakeholders apart from investors, customers, 
suppliers, government, they will have NGO, they'll also have, you know, people which are basically in the public domain and they will kind of, you know, look at having a bit of a, uh, you know, check on the organization, uh, which would mean that they kind of fall into something called civil society. So when we look at CSR, a corporate social responsibility or responsibility of the organization towards environment, not polluting the environment, you will see that <clears throat> there are lots of civil organizations which will keep a check on company operations and they will have to produce reports and do audits across the year and they become a part of something called civil. Because there are lots of employees, it's not just one, two, three, because there are lots of employees. So that is why this category also becomes important and they are also a stakeholder in the business. Sometimes, as I mentioned earlier, when you see um, employees um, given stock option plans, so they also become shareholders, but they are also an integral part of, you know, the organization. An example here I would also give is to relate, like we have John Lewis partnership. Now John Lewis is a big retailer in the UK, which sells pretty much everything. They have their stores. Now here each employee is also the owner of the company. So they have certain number of shares depending on the number of service and they are categorized in both the sides. So they are, you are an employee, but you're also a partner or a stockholder in the company. Is that okay? Now, yeah. depending on the type of stakeholders, the priority also will be different. Now, who is important within the company when they say something? Do you think a manager is important? A supervisor is important? An employee is important? Or a director, when he says something, he's important? Director is most important. So when you look at, we can then, spot on so when we look at you know their area of responsibility and we also look at their area of influence we classify them on the basis of something called priority or maybe the weight that they can kind of you know put on behind uh, any particular decision so help us to kind of you know put a bit of uh, you know importance or significance on the type of shareholders now going back to unilever this is how they are business is structured. I should have actually had this slide slightly above, but this particular, uh, you know, structure of the organization, because they are present in very many countries, they have product type structures, they have corporate team, which is in the head office, and they also have geographical divisions or divisional structure. And if I have to expand this, in each of the divisions, they have four product divisions, personal care, food, home care, and refreshment. And each of the division will have a president or somebody leading it. But that person will be having reporting from all the different countries, managing director or the person who's the head of that particular product division in that country. So it becomes divisional. In the corporate team, they are in, based in the head office. They look at making and setting the direction for the business for two years, three years, five years, ten years. So they are basically, you know, working on strategic objectives. And the geographical divisions primarily divide the group into three different uh, types of uh, geographies, the Americas, North and South. You look at Europe. Uh, when you look at Asia, Africa, Central and Eastern Europe, because they are smaller economies, they are grouped together into one group. Sometimes companies call it EMEA, Europe, Middle East, Africa. So when you look at this uh, categorization, which happens wherein a head within uh, this particular region would be having reporting from different people in different countries because the business is so large they create these divisions to better manage and operationalize the business and because the person heading the business is from this particular region or geography they understand the culture the background the markets quite well and that is why the divisional structure or the geographical structure of the organization works better but if it was a small business, for example <clears throat> when i look at say an ice cream business you know in in say pakistan i know there is what is the popular ice cream brand in pakistan walls yeah yeah, yeah am i correct there is something called walls uh, walls ice cream is it yeah yeah walls and omar yeah so when you look at omar and walls they were small businesses which started in one or two cities but over the years these guys have expanded and given a run for uh, their money to Unilever and some of the other brands uh, you know which have similar businesses but they are as successful because what they have been able to do is they know the customers better they know their requirements better and they have produced goods or localized goods which are meeting or exceeding the requirements 
local consumer and a lot of multinational organizations have taken time to kind of you know follow that lead so here when they look at their business they might not have this or these two structures they will have maybe a corporate team here they will have a, a you know a regional office here and then they'll have smaller city offices from which the distribution of the products are sold because it requires refrigeration and you know, these products are then sold into different cities with, through distributors and stockists and you know things like that so they might there because it is not a company which is present in lot many countries it's just pakistan they might just have one divisional structure wherein it will be the head office then the regional offices and then the distribution center or local offices in cities branch offices as we call them is that okay so, let's look at when we understand you know the type of stakeholders and we know uh, what kind of role they play how we need to understand is what kind of structure they help develop within the organization now if you look at japanese organization they have a very autocratic structure that means the person at the top might make a decision and everybody in the organization follows an example of that that i would give you is army for example when you look at the general making decision on the top everybody within that uh, you know division or the uh, you know regiment or whatever they will follow that order uh, you know they cannot go against that order so here okay. what you see is an autocratic type of system wherein one person has the sole decision making power and his decision is more or less final and i've given you at this is an example is when you look at different organizations and different type of structures what you will see is that they have different type of leadership styles and the type of stakeholders within the organizations kind of help shape the culture and type of organization it, or the image of the organization it portrays externally so when you look at japanese and korean organizations you they have of autocracy and their structure of the organization is quite hierarchical that means will be if you have to speak to somebody uh, you know seen enough you have to go to your boss only your boss will go to your line manager they will go to your general manager and then in general they will go to uh, if the problem is not solved go to the senior management when you look at european organizations they typically tend to have something called a functional structure in the functional structure is what they try and do is they group people together into the type of function they perform within the organization so people who work on products or basically look at product engineering creation of products new features they are grouped together into something called product function so when you look at an organization like microsoft you will see that they are grouped as a functional uh, organization in terms of products so xbox gaming as one product your bing or search as a second product your windows or you know uh, operating system as a third product and then you look at you know the cloud based computing services and other things that they are producing uh, being the other side of the organization so what they have done is a large business it is us centric but these organizations have a very flat organizational structure and what they do is they group them according to the function in which the uh, you know or function or type of services the businesses provide now so in task 1.3 what we are looking at doing is we are trying to understand what a type of responsibility each of these stakeholders will have when they work within you know the um, uh, the organization so here what we want to be able to do is in 1.3 we want to understand how the structure actually supports the various objectives which the stakeholders want them to accomplish now who is the stakeholder can you recall who is the stakeholder stakeholders are the group of people which are directly or indirectly being affected by the business this yes so if i have to say responsibility yeah if you give me an example of one stakeholder investor employees customers suppliers government ngos brilliant right so when you look at stakeholders here if we say uh, the first stakeholder you have said say for example employees or you have said directors of the board now one of the stakeholders will be the stakeholder in terms of shareholder his main objective will be that okay i am not too involved in this all i want to know is at the end of the year how much the company makes uh, how much profit does the company make and from that profit how much of earning per share i get in terms of as a dividend now his or her major expectation from the business or the company is the profit the business makes or generates and what they get as a dividend at the end of the year so the 
priority or the objectives of the stakeholder in this case when i talk about shareholders is different from the priority and objectives of the employee the employees might have a objective that they would say that okay <clears throat> at the end of the year i want to get a pay rise i want to get month i want to get paid monthly as per uh, the contract and their meaning would be described in my contract year on year when i work for this organization so you see the difference in terms of priorities these stakeholders will have is as an employee you want to get paid you want to get the perks and services which you have uh, which are described in your contract but when we look at a shareholder somebody who has ownership in the company wants to see how much profit you make at the end of the year they want to see you know essentially um uh, let's put it this way how much share dividend or earnings per share they can get as a dividend from the organization if i look at suppliers their main function would be that they want to see that okay if i supply any goods and services to you uh, and i'm a contractor supplier then i should be paid in 30 days against the invoice which have been raised or paid in you know 7 days whatever terms and conditions have been negotiated and their expectation in terms of uh, objectives would be different that when i supply when we deliver you sign the delivery off you we raise an invoice you pay us in 7 days and uh, and then you keep giving us time in terms of you know minimum order quantity for you to supply year on year or month on month or you know week on week so their objectives will be slightly different so here the uh, the main thing that we want to understand is we want to pick up maybe when you start doing the assignment what you have to look at is define what are stakeholders as you've rightly yeah. said employees directors you know staff suppliers and each of the stakeholders with the taking an example of an organization you will have to look at how their objectives are different and met how they are met so here in this case what we want to do is understand the objectives of each of the share, uh, uh, stakeholders and then explain how they are met is that okay yeah. so <clears throat> when we look at you know structure of the organization and the culture of the organization that kind of feeds in to how these objectives are met and depending on the uh, you know the leadership which is uh, provided by the you know people in the organization it helps them uh, you know clearly define these objectives now on a day to day basis an employee would be given a job description right when you join a particular job you are given a job description and you are given then a probation period or a certain number of weeks to get comfortable into that job now once you are comfortable into that job your line manager or your person somebody who's managing you would expect very clearly that this is something that you should be able to achieve on a day to day basis on a monthly basis and towards the end of the year a review is done as they find in the performance appraisal or the review that you are meeting your objectives or you are meeting not meeting or you are exceeding the objectives that will kind of determine the type of rise in salary or you know um um uh, say for example a promotion or what kind of perk you receive additional responsibility you receive for the next year will be decided correct mm -hmm. so when we look at uh, somebody joining into the organization as new they are given a bit of time to settle down in the organization because they want to familiarize themselves understand the policies and processes and once they understand the policies and processes become used to it then that person would be able to run and you know do the job more effectively a simple example in this case would be if somebody comes in and joins new in the sales side of the organization what they will need to know is they will need to understand how the quotation are sent what type of customers the business handles do you go out and take calls so sometimes you will see a line manager will go out on two or three calls with you just to explain how the you know the account management is done or how you would want to you know deal with the customer how do you want to provide information and once the person becomes independent then the line manager leaves the person on his own because they say that you have become comfortable now and you can manage it and what your aim is to then is to maximize the business month on month from that account and that being put into place as an employee once you have the job description and you had this probation period to settle down you clearly understand that how these objectives are met what efforts you have to put in to get the sale and then once you start getting that you are then left on your own and then you start performing correct so this is how the objectives from different people or different type of stakeholders in the organization would be looked at and they will be slightly different okay so yeah. just to summarize the session now what we have 
So today it's been a bit of a long session because I think the idea is I want to get you to understand some of the things in terms of how the delivery is. It is quite detailed to a certain extent. And I think, um, you know, after I do a number of sessions, we will send you some sort of a feedback to try and say, if you are able to follow it, is it too detailed? Is it brief enough? Or how are you going about it? And then we'll tailor the delivery accordingly. But I think from my point of view, uh, I'm quite happy with the, you know, I would like to get some comments from you. But I think in general, I'm quite happy with how the session ran. We had a bit of an issue in the beginning with regards to the, you know, the voice, but that has been resolved. So just to summarize, and I'll take your comments after this, just to summarize, you know, what we've done today is we've understood how the structure of the company is done, structuring of the business is done, types of structures, uh, and, you know, the types of companies which are formed. We've looked at briefly the, the, the types of stakeholders in the organization and what are their roles and responsibilities. And sometimes when the objectives have to be set for these stakeholders, how these objectives are set, what is the role of the culture and the structure within the organization and how this culture and structure of the organization helps the objectives to be set and then met for different stakeholders. Is that okay? Yeah. Good stuff. Any questions at your end? Yeah, I was just going through the assignment brief yesterday and there were like two, three questions which I want mm -hmm. to ask from you regarding the uh, word limit that was around 2,500. But as the assignment brief uh, content says that, you know, I have to uh, include the uh, diagrams and tables and stuff like that. So how am I going to, um, uh, uh, like, uh, how am I going to count the number of words in diagrams and tables? Like when we write a simple assignment, I know like there's a simple content writing paragraphs and stuff, I can easily calculate the number of words I'm writing. But in case of diagrams, what will be the rules and, um, uh, well, I can say, uh, what, what will be the rules I'll be following in order to uh, meet the word limit? See, my, my suggestion to you will be that when you're looking at uh, the assignment brief, the word count given is primarily just as a recommended word com count from a point of view of reference. It has got nothing to do with, uh, you know, you could send me a 10,000 word assignment, but you need to be happy with it because that needs to cover most which are defined in the task. Now, the the reason why there is a bit of a, let's put it this way, two sides of the coin. The first is the reason why this word count has been given is that it has been given for you to kind of understand clearly that this is something which is a mandatory requirement going further when you look at going into a university and at some point in time, what they do is they have to ask strict into what you need to write in terms of the words. Now. Having said that, the flip side of the coin is that because you're getting to grips with writing assignments, which is might be slightly different as against taking an examination, my suggestion to you would be if you understand the command verbs, which is something which I had briefly uh, you know, asked you to look into uh, at the time of induction. And the other would be to address the task, you know, so that if you feel that you've addressed the task, because this particular uh, qualification that you're doing only has a pass or not yet pass, or, uh, you know, there's no, um, uh, what you call merit or distinction. So in order to look at doing the task, my session would be if you just provide what is being asked for, nothing more, nothing mm -hmm. less. So like in this case, it says instructions, task 101, it says create a portfolio with the following details. So a table differentiating purpose of public and private sector organization. Right now, the reason why we do also some of these things in teaching backwards is to give you a clear idea that this is what is required. Now, if I look at part A, this is what is required. That's it. Do you get it? So this is a table for differentiating purpose of public and private sector organization. This case table gives you the summary and this is meeting the pass, uh, task one, uh, task A. Exactly. So you have to think objectively. Copy this uh, uh, thing, or can I? Uh, word in this case, you wouldn't probably look at a word limit on on this. You know, don't worry about the word limit. Mm -hmm. As long as the task you are, what is being asked for, you are answering and providing that information, that will be good enough. It talks about a general mind map showing main stakeholders of the organization and their objectives, regulatory bodies. This, uh, if you put this chart in this chart, and you put this chart in which is the different stakeholders and their priority. That would do that task, B.
Right. Is that okay? Yeah. So that would basically do A and B straight away. And that covers your learning outcome one. Mm -hmm. As simple as that. Is that okay? You might have to yeah. explain this in some words because I'm only showing you the PowerPoint slide. So maybe what you could do is you could put a picture or a table of this under the task one, which says table initiating. So you might define what is a public sector organization. You might define what is a private sector organization. And once you've defined that, you can put this in. That's it. And that will do the task. Okay. Is that okay? See, at level four, the idea is you want to look at what is being asked and you reply to point what is being uh, required in that task. That's it. So if I ask you, how would I over, particularly talking about uh, this task, the task task one for learning this uh, portfolio, but I'm seeing that I have some very much stuff on the slides. So can I just pick them up from there and insert that in my yes. assignment? Would that be okay? Would that be considered as plagiarism Absolutely or you know something okay. like that? Absolutely okay. No problem. Okay. Okay. Right. So for this, basically, for this unit, what they're asking you to create a portfolio. That's it. So this is mm -hmm. going to be, you know, it's going to be more visual, this assignment. But mm -hmm. for example, it is diagram explaining Michael's Porter's five forces model. What we will do is when I cover this up with you, we are looking at explaining what is a uh, or what is by Michael Porter who created the five forces model. We will look at that uh, theoretical model and then in putting the diagram, what we will do is we will look at explaining that in 30 to 50 words with an example that in what yeah. case we use the five forces model. Hmm. So just putting the diagram might not be, uh, you know, meeting the task. So you have to put the diagram of a five forces model. And once you've done that, in 30 to 50 word, you will explain why and where we use Michael Porter, Porter's five forces model. Hmm. That's it. Okay. Great. Yeah. So look at the assignment objectively. What is asked? Hmm. And what you're providing that's it at this stage this assignment does not require you to do lots of analysis lots of evaluation nothing like that this is a very simple unit we have to follow it and i will it's a good thing that you've asked me this question so it says a table showing the impact of fiscal and monetary policies so how you by putting a table you cannot show the impact so what you have to do is define what is a fiscal policy define what is a monetary policy when i cover it in the next presentation tomorrow what I'm going to do is then we are going to talk a particular country like UK or Pakistan and look at how the government uses these instruments to drive supply and demand or increase growth, you know, uh, kind of run the increase the GDP of the economy. And that is mm -hmm. something which I will have to explain in 30 to 50 words. So I will put a small picture down which defines fiscal policy or a graph or a chart which basically shows how the uh, policy implementation is happening, but I have to explain it by 30 to 50 words to meet that task. Hmm. Okay. Right. Good stuff. Any other question? Yeah, um, one more thing. Just a minute, I'll just go through and ask. Okay, so would you suggest me any readings from the book? Like you were saying that you will be telling me to read some pages out of the book that could be uh, an uh, additional help for me when I'll be doing right. assignments. So what I'm going to do is, after this, I'm going to send you a quick email with a copy of the presentation, though I've uploaded it here. And I will also refer you to the pages that you need to read in the book. Okay. Okay, it will be specific pages because this book covers the full unit. And this book is not mm -hmm. just used at level four. This book is at level five also when you have economics in business, level six, which is economics in business, and level seven also, the, this book will be business environment. The name of the unit will change. And when you study at different levels, we will start to study in more detail this content. Uh, you know, uh, for example, when we look at policies which the government uses or fiscal instrument the government uses, they are used across from level four to seven till you do your master's degree. But the depth mm -hmm. in which we we'll start studying will be higher as you go up in the levels. This mm -hmm. book has a very detailed knowledge about some of these things. My idea would be to try and recommend you a few pages that you need to read to develop understanding, the basic understanding at this moment to, uh, to, to understand the requirements of meeting the criteria of assignment brief at level four. Mm -hmm. Okay? Right. Okay, so, 
up till now we do not uh, need to touch the Harvard referencing for this particular unit or we'll be doing this in this unit too no no Harvard referencing you will cover in research when we do the unit but there okay. will be when you do some definitions of policies and other bits and pieces you will need some references to be put like if I put a diagram of uh, you know say for example Porter's five, five forces model so to give you an example here five forces model right so if I pick this up just as an example and I go in and from mind tools if I have to put this into a document you know, if I bring this model into a document from this particular thing I have to put a reference where have I got this from so here it will be say you know figure how will I put figure one if this is figure in the assignment and I will say you know Porter's five forces model right comma um, that's it and then I will put basically comma and I'll put source so where is the source I've taken it from mind tools and I've accessed it on 2017 now this is referencing just for the diagram when you are covering it in the assignment but when I go and do my develop my bibliography towards the end of the assignment what I am going to do is I have to pick up the site from which I have picked this picture up right so what I will do is I will put this up uh, here say the first reference and then I will say assessed or accessed on sorry I have today you know access the website so I've accessed it on 17 you know 02 slash 2018 it will become Harvard referencing but this is only the website but when I look at it from a book say example I put find this from the business environment book on Moodle then in that case what I will do is I will write the uh, date author style referencing so first I write the name of the author so in this case if I go into the book here which is business environment and in this book say for example this book is uh, one second so if I have uploaded this book just to give you an idea this book is written by Worthington the author right so in this case to reference it from a book what I'm going to do is Worthington um, and then this book was published which is this edition so it was published in 2006 right and then what I'm going to do is if I have to do this say as a referencing within the paragraph of the assignment this is how well I'll do but apart from that what I'm going to do is from which page I've taken this uh, you know um, uh, what do you call Potter's five Morse's model model example if it's on page 232 that will become a referencing within the text but if I have to then uh, put this up within the bibliography what I'm going to do is write the name of the author you know and then say 2006 as a publication and then from which chapter I picked it up from. so assuming the chapter is five forces or you know basically external forces in the business environment and then page 232 and then towards the end or if what the bibliography will look like is that okay so if there is referencing which we will teach you or go through in any case when we do research you can go through the referencing part of the presentation of how to reference primarily when you look at uh, you know the Harvard reference presentation that we have loaded uploaded here but when you do diagrams and when you you know take material from somewhere you have to reference it like this and then underneath that what I have to do is okay it is only asked for Porter's five forces model but that's fine I put the four or five forces model talking about this but what I have to do is I've also to explain what is five forces model and when I explain five forces model what I um, you know a bit of uh, the you know the five forces so for example uh, if I have to here uh, you know talk about competition talk about substitution uh, you know the buying power sub buyers and suppliers and talk about the threat for new entry which is uh, you know threat from substitutes or threats from competitors I will at the end of the day give a bit of an example to cover this off and that would mean the assignment is covered or the task is covered so I will write something here which will be about 30 to 50 words 
let me just put uh, you know I say for example in particular uh, you know somebody if they have submitted this before so in this case the part you know that is what they've done what is five forces analysis what they've done is they've bit, done a bit of definition here explain the model and then put it across in this particular diagram now this is that task which is meeting that task right here can you see that so they have defined Porter's five forces model. What does it do? Explain each of the components. And then within that, they have taken an example of Microsoft or something to explain, you know, briefly that why it is used, where it is used uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the analysis when a company wants to do, uh, you know, study what are the factors which externally affect the product to the business. Right. Right. Okay. So this is where ideally you will need to when i when i look at this particular task which is given up in the assignment brief here it says a diagram explaining piker porter's model that is what will meet the criteria hmm. okay right i will send this to you as an example what, what i'm going to do is i'm going to ask you to refer to some pages in any case in the book but i will send you a particular handout which is a specific handout for that we've covered 1.1 1.2 1.3 now you cannot copy that handout and put it in your assignment but that is to give you an idea of how this uh, task set or how these tasks have to be attempted is that okay yeah. that's fine good anything else so yeah it's pretty much clear to now so tomorrow we'll be meeting at this uh, same time we are looking at doing tomorrow i think i put 10 10 a.m early uh, slightly early so we'll start at 10 a.m tomorrow is that okay i have another student we have another student who's doing the same course called Vajid, and he's from dubai originally he's not based in dubai so i'd send the invite out, out to him today as well but i think he's not been able to join let's see if he can join tomorrow but there are about three or four students you know in particular who uh, are going to be you know uh, doing this course so sometimes we'll have one or two or sometimes we'll have at least three or four joining the same course Great, great. Okay, so we'll have a bit of inter interaction also going, you know, as far as the uh, the uh, the teaching is concerned. All right. Okay, good sir, Malia. Thank you so much for joining the session, and I will catch up with you tomorrow for learning outcome two, and I'll send you this email out in a couple of minutes. All right.